Hey, good evening. Welcome to another week here of Bible Study Fellowship. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, John chapter 15 tonight, uh, continuing in the upper room discourse between Jesus and his disciples on the night that he was to be betrayed. Let me pray for us and we'll go ahead and get started. Lord, uh, as we come to you, uh, I pray that you would help us to hear and understand the words that you have. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, interpret them correctly, uh, be with my words, and Lord, I pray that we would uh, come out of this uh, better branches in your vine. I pray all this in your name. Amen. I think one of the things that uh, Sam's Club and Costco have figured out, at least in America, is we like things that are big. Uh, this bag of chips has 30% more. At Sam's, you could get a 36 pack of soda rather than just a normal 24 pack. Uh, when I go to Sam's Club, I can buy a package of toilet paper that is so large that I'm really not confident that it's going to fit in my car. Uh, we, If we get apartments, we want them to be big ones. If we're going to get a car, we want it to be an SUV, a big one. If we're going to get a drink at McDonald's, give me the largest one that I can get. Uh, this sense of quantity also makes its way into our lives. We, uh, at work, we have all these things that we're doing. We have all these projects. Look at the quantity of things that I'm doing. Uh, and it can make our way into relationships. You know, we want to, we're aware of the quantity of people, the number of people that are, are in our lives. We want our, our friends to be big and large groups of friends and many people uh, that we are connected with on the internet via social media. And I think in a certain sense, this desire to be big, this desire to have quantity can make its way into our spiritual lives as well. Even if we look at the disciples and some of the things that they were interested in doing, uh, Peter wanted to die for Jesus. Uh, he wanted to do a great thing. He wanted to do a big thing. And in other gospel accounts, we see James and John asking to be seated at the right hand of Jesus when he gets into his kingdom. And so we want to do great things. We want to do big things. We want to do things that are filled with quantity. And it sort of makes Jesus's words, uh, in a sense, difficult for us to hear as we come into John 15. Because Jesus is talking about the way to achieve greatness in his kingdom is by bearing fruit. Uh, and, you know, we want to sort of get this idea like, yeah, 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 if I'm going to bear fruit, I'm going to be a branch. I'm going to be a big branch. I'm going to have like a lot of stuff. I'm going to have a lot of leaves. I'm going to have a lot of fruit. And I'm going to be big. I'm going to be going everywhere. I'm going to be doing all kinds of things as a branch on Jesus's vine. Uh, when people walk past me in the vineyard, they're going to say, now there's a big branch. That's a big branch right there. Uh, and so I think this sense of, of doing great things in greatness, um, that's what we want. And I, I don't think that's exactly what Jesus is getting at as he is sharing with his disciples about being uh, branches on his vine. Uh, sort of the, the aim of our lesson this week is to help us learn that that Jesus's followers can show the world that they're connected to him by bearing fruit, by bearing fruit, not by being a big branch or a great branch. As Jesus gets started, he's, he begins with an analogy. He says, I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, this would have been an analogy that would have made a lot of sense in the first century because vineyards and vine growing was a, a major thing that happened in the nation of Israel. Uh, they would have been familiar with it. They, many of them might have worked in vineyards or known about vineyards or had members of their families who owned vineyards. And uh, we just don't have that same concept. And so I think the this vine analogy falls down for us a little bit, but the reality of vines and vineyards and and certainly grapes, these are grapes that they're, that they're thinking about, is that a fruit-producing tree will add branches and leaves 
in such a way that the new growth, the new branches that it puts out will prevent the sun from reaching to some of the the old growth or the existing growth sites. And so what can happen is that through growth, through becoming bigger and having more branches or shoots and leaves, actually your vine is going to end up producing less fruit because the sun cannot equally penetrate all parts of the vine. So the vine dresser will prune or clean the vine with some type of cutting device. You know, usually in our day and age, it'd be like a, you know, a clippers or a scissors or something like that. I don't know exactly what they would have used in the first century. Uh, but the mission of the disciples is Jesus is not expecting the disciples to, to produce grapes. But the implication is that the mission of the disciples is to bear fruit. Um, and in order to do that, there are some similarities between the disciples and a vineyard or a vine. Namely, the disciples need to be pruned. And this word pruned, uh, your Bibles may alternatively translate that as cleaned, which sort of connects us in with that idea of like Jesus washing the disciples' feet, that notion of clean and dirty that we were wrestling with in prior passages. And unlike a vine dresser who cuts away uh, shoots or branches, uh, the thing that Jesus has used in his disciples have been his words. The words of Jesus are the thing that has brought about the cleaning of the disciples. In John 6, the disciples, uh, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. And so as many disciples in John 6 were choosing to leave Jesus, uh, these 12 and then now 11 were deciding to stay. They were deciding to remain. Uh, They were going to continue to be with Jesus, to be in the presence of his words and his teaching and his cleaning of them so that they would be in a position to bear fruit. Uh, Jesus goes on to point out that apart from this process of being cleaned in verse 3, Uh, there is a sense of abiding, of remaining. And we've talked about that again, remaining in Jesus' words. Uh, The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, and neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he will bear fruit. So there's a sense that for the disciples to bear fruit, they must remain in the vine. They must remain in the vine in the words and the presence of Jesus. If we're going to produce fruit that lasts, we must remain in Jesus. Uh, I think one of the interesting things as we get into verses 5 going through verse 8, it's key to remember that fruit is not something that is for the vine or even for the branches. Uh, fruit is produced for the vine dresser. Uh, It'd be uncommon to see fruit being gobbled up by the plant that produced it itself. It's it's something that's being produced for some other purpose, for some other person, in this case, the vine dresser. And the other thing about fruit that probably bothers us as as maybe as American uh, followers of Jesus is that it's not a fast process. There's a single harvest of fruit per year. Uh, there is a, it's often slow if you have a tree in your yard that, that makes apples or fruit or something like that. You know, it's really, you're looking at the tree every day, you're like, it doesn't look any different. But over time and slowly, uh, fruit begins to appear and grow and, and hopefully get larger if you have a fruit tree in your yard. And the job of the branch is you know, the branch is, is really not contributing a lot to the growth of fruit. The job of the branch is to, is to stay connected to the one who produces fruit, namely Jesus himself, if we're thinking about uh, the spiritual reality of the disciples. In verses 5 through 8, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
Uh, again, the, the branch's job is to remain connected from the vine. If the branches become disconnected, if they fall off the tree, if they don't produce fruit, ultimately those branches are gathered uh, and they are burned. Jesus goes on to say that uh, the branches, the people who are connected to the vine, can make requests of God. They can make requests. Uh, and we've, we've talked about this in previous weeks. We've seen this before where uh, we are called to ask in, in, in the name of Jesus, and, and what, will that, what will that bring? That will bring answered prayer. Uh, those, those requests that the true branches make are going to be answered. And again, if we look at Jesus as the example, what were the kinds of things that Jesus asked the Father for? If we're connected to the vine, we're going we're gonna to do vine sorts of things as the branches. And so Jesus, in John 11, uh, he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. You always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So again, Jesus is praying that God's chosen one, namely Jesus, would, would be received and accepted by people uh, that, that God had ultimately made. John 12, Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name. And so the things that Jesus is praying for are not necessarily things for himself, but he is praying that God's purposes and God's objectives in the world will be carried out. Ultimately, uh, the branches, by bearing fruit, Jesus' disciples will prove that they belong to Jesus. Uh, As we look in verses 9 through 12, there is a call that the branches are going to follow the pattern of Jesus. Uh, I won't read it all, but as the Father has loved me, verse 9, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So again, Jesus is calling his disciples to follow his example, to follow the pattern that he has established for them. Jesus kept the Father's commandment, this idea of remaining. Jesus kept the Father's commandment. The disciples must keep Jesus' commands. And, And Jesus makes the point that the result of doing this is ultimately joy. Uh, following Jesus' commands is to be a source of joy for the apostles. Also, uh, there's a notion in here of the some of the, the there's a command that Jesus gives to his disciples. Uh, the command is that they love one another, verse 12, as Jesus has loved them. Again, following the example of Jesus. Jesus reveals his ultimate plan to the disciples. He indicates that his purpose is that he will lay down his life for his friends. And so uh, by, by sharing the ultimate plan with these men, Jesus is saying, you are no longer servants, but you are now friends because you know what my purpose is. Jesus points out that people who are his friends are the people who carry out Jesus' commands. And what is his command? His command is to love one another. And in this way, the disciples are called to produce fruit that will last. And again, that fruit seems to be relying upon Jesus, relying upon the connection to the vine to be able to love people in the way that Jesus did. We are trying to follow the pattern that Jesus has established for his people. The principle for this section is that Jesus calls his disciples to live in the way that he did. Uh, In a certain sense, if if you and... uh, YouTube is a place where many of us probably go to see how something is done. If we want to know... Uh, how to change a part of our car, how to clean something in our house, uh, how to make an interesting food item that we've never made before, we can go to YouTube and hopefully not just read about, but see the way that something is done. If the the video is done well, we can see, you know, maybe what screws to take out or how to mix something or how to make something or how to do something. 
Uh, and it is a way for us to learn how to do something that we don't know because we've seen somebody else do it. And I think that the gospel writers, as they began to reflect upon and think about Jesus's words, they began to realize that it was going to be important for people to be able to see how Jesus lived. YouTube wasn't around in the first century. They, they couldn't take videos of Jesus and share them. So they started to write down the things that they remembered about what Jesus did, what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit helped them and brought to mind the things that he had spoken, the things that he had done. And this ultimately led to maybe the first social media experience, which is the Gospels. Uh, The Gospels want to present a picture to us. We have four of them to have four different perspectives to help us see how Jesus lived in this world. What did it look like as Jesus lived in the first century? And as you and I have been studying the Gospel of John this year, I wonder if you've experienced some pruning or cleaning because of the words of Jesus, because of the way that Jesus interacted with people in the Gospel of John. Has there been a part of this Gospel, as you've read it, that you felt that it cut you, that it cut you to your heart? that you were convicted of something that you had done, of something that you had said, of some belief that you hold. Perhaps you've experienced joy, the joy that Jesus talked about from carrying out his commands because you've read and understood what it looks like to follow Jesus' example because of the time that you've spent in John's gospel. Perhaps your story is a little bit more aligned with the branches that don't make fruit and that are on the ground. Uh, And as you look back on your life, you know, you feel like, I got no fruit. I have this wasteland of pain and brokenness and bad decisions that maybe you feel like you've made or that have happened to you. Um, Friends, God is the master vine dresser. And in the same way that he can prune and cut away the vines, Jesus... Jesus and God have the ability to graft us, to graft people back into the vine. Um, Ask God, ask Jesus to put you back in, to plug you back in, to, to dress you back on, to graft you back in so that you can be connected to Jesus, so that you can produce fruit, follow his commands, and be able to experience joy in this world. Let's go on to the next section, uh, John 15, 18 through 25. Uh, we are seeing that the world hates Jesus. So you're on the vine. You're following Jesus' commands. You're experiencing joy. You're getting pruned. You are living the life of a healthy branch connected to the vine of Jesus. How will the world react to you? Well, Jesus tells us you're going to be hated. Uh, This is what Jesus said. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And so this is the response that the world is going to have for those people that are connected to the vine of Jesus and that are producing fruit. Uh, You're going to look and begin to act and begin to talk the way that Jesus did. And because the world hated Jesus, the world will hate the people that look and act and are connected to Jesus. Jesus made a statement to his disciples. He said, I've chosen you out of the world. And the idea of this means that by following Jesus, you have become a servant in the kingdom of God. You are no longer a servant of this world, but your allegiance, your citizenship, uh, you have become a, a member of the kingdom of God. Jesus came and he showed himself to the people of the first century and Many people, uh, not all people, but many people hated him. Uh, Ultimately, Jesus, we're going to see in in the next several chapters, Jesus is going to be crucified by the people uh, that were in the land of Jerusalem, the ones that he came to. The the light that he revealed to them was ultimately rejected by these people. And so 
part of the challenge of being a follower of Jesus uh, is that the world will hate you because Jesus, because Jesus was hated first. I think, again, it's important for us to remember what did Jesus do? How did he respond to the haters? Um, he kept talking to them about the Father. He kept performing miraculous signs. He kept loving his enemies. Uh, and we are called to do the same thing. We are called to follow Jesus's example. And the principle for this section, Jesus's words, servant follows the example of his master. Servant follows the example of his master. Uh, there's a, you know, musical groups that are out there that exist as cover bands. Their goal is to be as close to the original band as possible. So I looked on the internet and I saw a couple of them here and a couple of them I'll just share some names with you. You can figure out if you know who they are. So the first one is Dread Zeppelin. Uh, obviously a cover band uh, for Led Zeppelin. One of the ones that I thought was great was uh, Girl Haggard. Uh, so they are three women that play Merle Haggard tunes. And there is a, another all-women cover band called Princess. So they make cover music for the, the artist Prince. Eagle Eyes for the Eagles. And of course, uh, Australian Pink Floyd. And again, the goal of these bands is not to make their own sound or do their own thing, but they want to try to emulate and impersonate as much as possible the original. So it's a cover band. And that is what we are called to do. Uh, we are called to be cover bands of Jesus. We are never going to be as good as he was, but our goal is to try and emulate and say and do and love other people the way that he did. That is our mission. That is the work that Jesus has set before us. Fortunately, fortunately, we can see this in verse 26. I'm jumping ahead. Fortunately, but when the helper comes, uh, I, he, that will be sent to us by the Father. Uh, we are going to need help to be able to do this. We are not going to be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and 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 emulate and have a cover band of Jesus, but Jesus is going to send us help, and we'll read uh, a little bit more about that as we learn more about the Holy Spirit next week. But I think as we think about this this process of trying to follow Jesus, what parts have been hard for you? What parts are hard for me? What are some of the things that we look at and we say, I, I just don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can pull that off. I don't know if I can really genuinely love people that way. Uh, perhaps what you've experienced is uh, as you've attempted to emulate Jesus and to follow Jesus, you've began to experience some rejection. Uh, and, and Jesus responded to that rejection in ways that I can't. You know, Jesus was on the cross and he's dying and he's like, Father, forgive them. They know that what they do. I don't know that my heart is there. Uh, but yet, uh, as we begin to experience rejection, we have to wrestle with, can we keep going? Can we keep loving? Uh, and what would it look like to, to continue to looking like Jesus and emulating him in the world? Well, I started off talking about Sam's Club and Costco and Sam's Club and Costco are going to sell big plants, big ones because they sell big bags of chips and big packages of soda. But the reality, friends, is that fruit-bearing plants are often small because they've been pruned and cut and trimmed so that all of their energy is directed into making fruit. And the reality is, is that if we're going to be successful in following Jesus, it means that there's other things in our life that are going to have to go. There'll be other things that we're not going to be able to do because it will impede our ability to make fruit for Jesus. And the other reality is, is that when a field or a tree or a vineyard or a whatever produces good and large and plentiful fruit, the vine dresser, the farmer gets the glory, not the plant not the branch. And, and that is also our work. Our work is to emulate Jesus 
and have the desire to bring glory to God. Let's pray and ask that God would help us do that. Heavenly Father, I pray that um, you would help us to be more like Jesus, knowing, Lord, that that is not an easy task. Uh, It is something that he worked very diligently and hard to do. And Lord, I pray um, that as we learn more about the role of the Holy Spirit, that you would send your spirit to help us live lives that are similar to our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.